Hi, I'm Elizabeth Bailey. India and Eurasia are slamming together as we speak. <laughs> this all started when India broke away from the southern supercontinent of Gondwana at roughly 120 MA. Here's a diagram of what I just said. <laughs> Asia has remained in roughly the same location during this time, as has Antarctica. Between 65 and 50 MA, India and Eurasia have exhibited convergence rates, rates which are with roughly twice that of any known present-day subduction zone. How did this happen? <laughs> Several models have been proposed to explain this ultra-fast convergence. Um, and I'm going to present some new work using paleomagnetism to help us understand uh, what happened. This continental collision has given us the Himalayas, the tallest, biggest mountain range on Earth. Here's a picture of the Himalayas. Here's a picture, here's a map of the Himalayas. Um, Eurasia is up here and India is to the south and in between them sandwiched in there is the Kohistan Ladakh arc, which I've colored green. To the west is Kohistan and to the east is Ladakh, which is where we went to take samples um, and bring them back here. Uh, the location of this unit is useful to us for understanding these plate motions um, due to its location between India and Eurasia. As we'll see in a minute, this is relevant to several models describing the motions of these plates. The models I'm going to talk about today involve two subduction zones between India and Eurasia. The idea behind this is that uh, the motions of the two subduction zones add constructively, um, giving us double fast convergence rate to what we would expect. Um, these models differ in the type of material that exists between India and Eurasia, as well as the timings and locations of the collisions that occur. Here is a two-stage collision model um, proposed by Yagut and Royden, and Ali and Wiki are here today. They've proposed this model. Um, at 50 MA, we have India colliding with the Kohistan Ladakh arc at a roughly equatorial latitude. And then between 50 MA and 40 MA, India drags the Kohistan Ladakh, uh, Kohistan -Ladakh arc with it um, up to Asia for the final continent-continent collision. Um, at 40 MA. Here's another model uh, using a t two subduction zones between India and Asia to account for this ultra-fast convergence. Um, this model has the Kohistan Ladakh arc as a microcontinent that first collides with Asia at 50 MA at a latitude of about 30 degrees north. Then later on, India comes and joins them um, at 30 degrees north for the final continent-continent collision. Um, so you can see um, these models differ in where the uh, intervening material is at 50 MA. Um, so we went to Ladakh and we got samples from the Kardong Volcanics, um, which others have dated at between 67 and 50 MA. Um, we took oriented samples um, by the typical paleomagnetic techniques. This is an orientation device that we use called a uh, Pomeroy. And the reason that we um, take oriented samples is that um, the inclination of samples at, very, at different latitudes um, is different and tells us what the paleo latitude was of the sample when it formed. So here's a diagram of the dipole of the Earth. You can see the inclination is illustrated here of the magnetic field, and it increases with increasing uh, latitude. Um, so we did field work in Ladakh. Here is the location of our field site. It was um, in Ladakh, near um, Eurasia, close to the Karakoram fault zone, which separates the two. Our samples um, were taken from four sites, KP1 through KP4, that were, were along a road cut. This is fairly common um, in paleomagnetism because road cuts are easily accessible and not especially prone to weathering. Um, here you can see our drilling process. We used a water-cooled, gas-powered drill. 
Then we took the samples back to MIT and performed several um, sets of measurements on them. First, we measured their natural remnant magnetization, which is the magnetization present in the rocks when they first form, or when we take them back and we haven't done anything to them yet. Um, then we subjected the samples to alternating field demagnetization as well as stepwise thermal demagnetization in order to find the characteristic remnant magnetization. So why do we perform um, this stepwise demagnetization? Why not just look at what magnetization is there? Well, I'm going to illustrate that for you now. Um, you can think of the magnetic moment of a sample as uh, a three-dimensional vector. This is a projection uh, into the two-dimensional plane. Um, so here we have the NRM. It's the magnetization of the sample before we've done anything to it. Then we begin to subject it to more and more severe demagnetization steps. You can see in this example, the uh, moment has not really decreased much, if at all, in magnitude, um, and is rather rotating around the origin. Then at even more severe demagnetization steps, we get another component, which is origin trending in a straight line. That component is the one we want, and we take that to be the characteristic remnant magnetization um, of the sample when it formed. This other component is um, taken to be an overprint, which formed later in the life of the rock. So from this, we get several high temperature results. Here are the results from site KP1. This is an equal area plot. You can think of it as the projection of a sphere onto the plane. Um, the perimeter of it represents a, an inclination of zero, which corresponds to a paleo latitude of roughly zero. Um, and for this site, the site mean direction was um, a paleo latitude of uh, about nine degrees north. Here at site KP2, um, again, we get a roughly equatorial paleo latitude. And again, at site KP4, roughly equatorial. So now that we have these results, we want to make sure that what we're looking at is, in fact, the characteristic remnant magnetization and not um, a magnetization resulting from um, a remagnetization process, which can happen due to lightning, weathering, and heating. One of the tools we used was a baked contact test. I'm going to explain what that is now. So say you have some underlying bedrock, and then a dike has intruded it at some point. So you can look at the magnetization directions both in the dike, near the dike, and far away from the dike. If you have the scenario where the dike magnetization direction is similar to the direction of the samples that are near it, but different from the direction that's, uh, of the samples that are far away, then you can pretty much take that to mean that the dike formed after this component formed, and it baked the samples that were near it. And therefore, the heated samples near it acquired a uh, remnant that is in the same direction as the dike, reflecting the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the time that the dike formed. Um, if, on the other hand, you have a scenario in which um, the direction is the same for all samples, then that is likely to mean that everything has just been completely remagnetized, and you um, the magnetization does not predate that of the dike. So here's our dike magnetization direction from site KP3. The inclination is roughly 30 degrees. And this shows um, the dike samples in red and the baked samples very close to the dike in blue. Compare this to the directions for our other sites, which are roughly equatorial. They're different from the direction of the dike. And so we have a baked contact test that we've passed. We also know that these samples um, are unmetamorphosed. They have not seen temperatures um, of even 350 degrees. So if it were the case that we had a remnant magnetization that just died at 350 degrees, then we would have cause for concern. 
However, our high temperature components last until about 580 at least. So that means it's very unlikely that these samples have been completely thermally remagnetized. Um, so to sum up, we have a high temperature component that reflects a roughly equatorial paleo latitude. Um, we passed the baked contact test and um, we have not had our samples completely thermally remagnetized. Also, because the high temperature component um, lasts up to about 580 degrees, it's probably being carried by magnetite, which is not especially prone to uh, weathering. So it's unlikely that chemical um, remagnetization has happened. Um, so to conclude, our um, results agree with um, the model of Wiki and Ollie, um, and it disagrees with um, the other model, which has this intervening material colliding with Asia um, first at that time. Uh, the next steps will be um, to perhaps find dates for our own samples and to perform more extensive field work. I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people um, for helping me with this project. Um, I want to thank Ben Weiss um, for being my advisor and also to Wiki and Ollie for um, getting the show on the road. And uh, <laughs> I also want to thank uh, rising professor Sonia Tiku and um, also the people at the Paleo Mag Lab here and um, grad students Claire Buchholz and Ben Klein for providing field notes and advice. And also, that's not everybody. Um, I am really thankful for having gotten involved with the department here um, in the past year. And I want to thank everybody who has been an advisor or a friend. <laughs>